Ukrainians began to demand independence. Now, such demands within the Tsarist Empire were ruthlessly suppressed, so the movement never really got very far. During the First World War, the country was occupied by Germany. After the outbreak of the Russian revolutions of 1917, it declared itself to be an independent republic. But within two years, the Bolshevik army reconquered it. And in 1922, Ukraine became one of the Soviet Union's constituent republics. Under the Soviets, the Ukraine initially was granted substantial cultural autonomy. But this was suppressed by Stalin, whose government also deliberately imposed a horrific famine on the country in the early 1930s, which was designed, many historians argue, to break the resistance of the peasantry to Soviet collectivization. During the Second World War, Ukraine was devastated by Nazi Germany, which aimed not only to annihilate the region's Jews, but also the Slavic population, basically to clear it out. Between five and six million Ukrainians died in the war. After the Soviets reconquered the country, Ukrainian nationalist forces, some of which had allied themselves with the Nazis in the hope of creating an ethnically pure Ukrainian state, resisted for several years, but eventually were crushed. After 1945, Ukraine became one of the Soviet Union's most important republics. In addition to remaining the USSR's breadbasket, it became a leading producer of industrial goods. In the sphere of culture, after Stalin's death, the government in Moscow reversed the drive to, Rus to Russify the country. And two of the Soviet Union's most important leaders, Nikita Khrushchev and Leonid Brezhnev, were themselves Ukrainians. In 1959, Khrushchev transferred the Crimean Peninsula from the Russian Soviet Republic to the Ukrainian Soviet Republic. In 1991, Ukraine declared independence from the collapsing Soviet Union and established a parliamentary republic with a strong executive branch. Over the last 30 years, the republic faced industrial collapse, hyperinflation, ethnic conflict, massive corruption, and political instability. In addition, a very important feature of Ukrainian history since independence is that the country remains wedged between two expansive imperialist entities. One of these is the NATO alliance, which is an important military arm of the European and North American capitalist powers. And it has expanded its reach deep into Eastern Europe in the decades since the end of the Cold War. NATO and the European Union aim to integrate Ukraine into their alliance. The Russian Federation, for its part, under Putin, is an autocratic regime that aims to reassert its power, directly or indirectly, in its former Eastern European territories. This policy is rooted in Putin's perception of the economic and strategic value of the region, but also in his sense of his own and Russia's historical role and destiny. It has pursued this policy, he has pursued this policy through military interventions in Georgia, uh, through illegal, the illegal seizure of Crimea in 2014, and through the intervention since 2014 in support of Russian separatists in the bloody civil war in Ukraine's Donetsk and Luhansk regions. The complex problems faced by independent Ukraine, and especially the issue of whether to build closer ties to the EU and the West or to Russia, have led, have led to major political upheavals, such as the Orange Revolution, in 2004 and the Maidan revolution of 2014, in which popular unrest attempted to reset the direction of the country. So in 2004, you had a contest between a pro-Western candidate backed by the EU and the US, Viktor Yushchenko, and uh, a pro-Russian candidate named Viktor Yanukovych, right? And in that contest, due to pressure on the streets, Yushchenko eventually became president, the pro-Western candidate. In 2010, Yanukovych was actually elected president, but in 2014, he was overthrown in the face of mass protests known as the Maidan Revolution after he decided not to sign an agreement for closer economic and political relations with the EU and instead move closer to Russia. His attempts to put down mass protests by force failed, and he decided to flee into exile in Russia. Now, in the wake of the Maidan events, Russia seemed set on moving, sorry, Ukraine seemed set on moving into a closer relationship with the West rather than Russia. From that point on, Putin shifted his strategy to one of force, first on the, on the, in the border territories 
and now against the Ukrainian state as such. So I'm going to leave it there, and I'm hoping that we can talk more about the specifics of what has happened in the last several months or years when we have our discussion. Thank you. Thank you all. Our next speaker is Michael Marks, Professor of International Studies, and he'll provide a theoretical framework to understand the reasons behind the So thank you very much for attending. Can you hear me? Is this oh, yeah. oh, so we should take them off. Okay. So um, World War One started in 1914, and a hundred years after, more than a hundred years after World War One, scholars are still arguing over what brought about the First World War. So a hundred years from now. Um, scholars are still going to be arguing over how to explain the Russian invasion of Ukraine. So at this point, we're really so close to these events that um, an accurate explanation um, is obviously subject to debate. And different scholars are putting forth different explanations as we speak for why the invasion took place. So what I'm going to do is give a, a pretty quick overview. It's sort of like an exercise in my introductory international politics class of how the major schools of thought that um, scholars subscribe to in the study of international relations would try to explain the invasion. Um, so the first explanation that scholars would put forth, and they already are, is that uh, the invasion is essentially a function of the distribution of power in the international system. Um, and this is essentially actually the argument that Vladimir Putin would make. Um, and a very prominent scholar in the United States by the name of John Mearsheimer has made. Uh, he gave a talk online uh, shortly before the invasion, which the Russian government is now actually retweeting. Um, and this argument goes that um, the West was essentially increasing its power and that Russia had no options but to uh, invade Ukraine to assert its power in the region. In some ways, this is sort of a modern day version of what Thucydides argued was the cause of the Peloponnesian War. For those of you who take my introductory international politics class who know this, Thucydides stated at the beginning of his history of the Peloponnesian War what made the war inevitable, and that's the uh, translation from the ancient Greek, what made the war inevitable was the rise of Athenian power, which put the fear into, uh, into the Spartan Empire. And uh, this is the argument that's being made by these so-called realist scholars of international relations. And it's a fairly parsimonious, straightforward explanation. They, they state that, that this war was essentially made inevitable by the changing distribution of power and the waning power of Russia, which had no choice but to exert its influence in the region. Um, a second explanation, so again, scholars disagree, there's no one answer um, for how to explain international politics. A second explanation that's being put forward right now is that this is essentially a function of the authoritarian political system in Russia. Um, and I'm sure that most of you have heard the, the term oligarch being tossed around these days, uh, that Russia today sort of resembles Germany um, at the outbreak of World War I. It's uh, not a monarchy, but it's basically an authoritarian political system with an economic elite that's very close to the political elite, and that Putin is looking to consolidate his authority. He has the backing of an oligarchic economic ruling class, um, and that he also um, sees um, an effort to unite what he sees as the Russian people as a way to solidify his authority in Russia to, to um, gin up support amongst the Russian people by claiming that this war was necessary to unite um, all of the Russian people in a, in a unified political system. So that's the second explanation. This is all very, I'm giving a very quick <laughs> overview. If you were to take my introductory international politics class, we spent a week on each of these theories, but we have limited time here. So I'm doing this, um, you know, in a, in a, in a, uh, in a succinct fashion. A third explanation is that, in fact, uh, Russia is acting in many ways according to prevailing norms. I mean, on the one hand, it looks like what Putin has done is, is deviant behavior, that he's violating international norms. 
I was watching uh, Fareed Zakaria's show on CNN Sunday morning, and he talked about how the invasion was a violation of the international rules-based order. Um, but on the other hand, war has been practiced for thousands of years. In many ways, the uh, exertion of military force is in itself a norm. And preemptive war, preemptive war um, is something that states have engaged in for a long time. So uh, one way to see this is that it's, it's not terribly surprising that a country would use the means that are available to it, um, given how international relations is constructed and the norms that uh, provide to countries appropriate ways to behave. Although in this particular case, one could make the claim that uh, Russia is sort of acting in a way that tests these norms. Um, I was a fourth explanation. Um, that all of international relations is a function of the global capitalist system and that war is a distraction. So that's essentially a Marxist explanation. It's pretty straightforward. Um, a fifth explanation, one, two, three, four, five, that, that war, uh, I'm not good at counting. Uh, math is not my strong point. That um, this war and all wars like it are a reflection of the way that masculinist norms frame politics. So a feminist theory would say, well, who, is, who is surprised by this? Politics reflects um, gendered norms, in particular the masculinist dominance of politics and that war is made possible um, because that's the way that politics is constructed from a male-oriented perspective. And then one last um, explanation is one that focuses on the decision-making dynamics of leaders. There's been a lot of speculation over the last week about whether Putin is acting irrationally. And that's an empirical question. That's not one that we can answer a priori. Um, psychologists are going to have to determine and look at the facts and try to determine whether he was misperceiving events or in, in fact, if he was making irrational calculations easy to think that he misunderstood things. Um, and one, one hypothesis I put forward is that when Putin met with Xi Jinping at the, out, at the outset of the Olympics in Beijing, that um, Xi Jinping said something to Putin that Putin construed to mean, go ahead and invade Ukraine. Uh, I, I like to make an analogy here to the outbreak of the first Persian Gulf War, where Saddam Hussein uh, was visited by the US ambassador who said to Saddam Hussein, uh, the United States sees your dispute with Kuwait as an Arab problem with an Arab solution, to which Saddam Hussein heard, the United States won't mind if you invade Kuwait. So it's quite possible that Putin went to Beijing and was prepared to hear what he wanted to hear. Uh, that no matter whatever Xi Jinping was going to say, that as far as uh, as far as I'm saying, as far as Vladimir Putin was concerned, he heard, I don't have any problem with you invade. Um, Ukraine. So that's a basic overview. Last comment, none of these theories, and this is something that I've been stressing in my classes as of late, none of these theories take into account everyday people. There is no theory of international relations, really, uh, although there's a growing but small group of scholars who argue that theories of international relations need to take into consideration everyday people, people like you and me, because those are the people who are now caught up in this conflict. And I guess I'll just say as my last comment here um, that I think my personal opinion is that we need theories of international relations that uh, take more into consideration how everyday people, you, me, everyone involved, um, plays a part in um, international politics, because those are the people who are being caught up in this conflict. And with that, I will um, yield the microphone. So that leads into very well into what I would like to talk about, which is more about everyday people's reaction response to this um, uh, uh, in Russia. Um, and it's very early, and we we don't have good you know survey results, but it's very difficult to get good survey results. In any case, um, in Russia, it's getting more and more difficult because of the. Uh, pressures on people um, not to speak out against uh, the government in any way um, or manner. Uh, and if you are, have been following uh, the, over the past few years, the situation in Russia, 
the media uh, has been, uh, which has been controlled by the state, especially television for quite some time, has become even, even more tightly controlled. Um, so any independent media um, in Russia has basically been labeled a foreign agent. And what you see on the screen here is the statement that every uh, foreign agent identified in an independent media source must include before every single article they post, every tweet they tweet, every post they put on Facebook. This pink one uh, is that pink color is um, the signature of Telekanal Goj, an independent uh, television station, satellite television station that only reached, uh, was only reaching uh, people by, um, uh, by internet. Uh, and they were just forced, uh, or they were just blocked on the internet within Russia yesterday. Uh, another very strong independent source uh, actually mostly financed by the Russian government and not labeled as, an, uh, as a foreign agent is the radio station Echo Moskvi, Echo of Moscow. They were also forced off the air yesterday. Uh, they're no longer able to broadcast. And because they are not a foreign agent, uh, uh, technically, uh, and because they are funded by Gazprom, the main natural gas company in Russia, uh, they are also being uh, excluded from European sources of uh, information. So they're caught in the middle. Um, so the, the, there are many independent journalists trying to do work or doing work in Russia, but it's very difficult to get those voices out. Uh, and I'm just going to show you here, this is um, uh, a hack that happened on Monday from down here, you'll see from journalists of Russia who are not indifferent to what's going on. Uh, and they, with the help of the hacking group Anonymous, were able to put this message up across many of the main state media sites on the internet on Monday. Uh, and it reads, Dear citizens, we call upon you to stop this madness. Don't send your sons and husbands to their certain death. Putin forces us to lie and exposes us to danger. We have been isolated from the whole world. People have stopped buying oil and gas. In a few years, we'll live like they do in North Korea. What use is this to us? So that Putin ends up in textbooks? This is not our war. We will stop it. This message will be removed and several of us will be fired or even imprisoned, but we can't take it anymore. This is a statement from some independent journalists uh, in Russia. And then in terms of what's happening on the streets, you may have seen images of protests that are happening in Russia. Protests are not allowed in Russia legally unless they're pre-approved by the government. You can imagine that the government is not going to approve an anti-war protest. Um, but nonetheless, uh, Russians are going out into the streets, not, you know, the, you know, not in tremendous numbers, but going out in the street does put you at severe risk of being arrested. Um, so this is a picture from uh, the February 24th protest, just after the invasion in Moscow. Uh, and you can see the slogan here says, peace for Ukraine, freedom for Russia. And these countries are just so tied together uh, culturally in all sorts of ways. Um, and we see the, the support for Ukraine here, but also the sense of, of uh, freedom for Russia is for Russia is, is connected to peace for Ukraine. And here's an uh, image of um, a single person picketer protest in Minsk, um, the capital of Belarus, from February 27th. Um, actually, I'm sorry, March 1st, just yesterday. Uh, so single picket protests are technically legal, but even these picketers are now being arrested. You're allowed to go stand out on your own with a poster, basically, uh, but we've seen footage of, of many single picketers getting arrested as well. Um, so we uh, see here a mother with a sign that says, stop the war, uh, her daughter riding around on her scooter, and her, the mother being detained. Um, and the last image I want to show you is a, sort of another form of protest um, uh, that is quite reminiscent of Soviet-era protest, having to talk sort of around an issue or talk in a very careful way to express your, uh, express uh, uh, criticism of the government and the policy. So this is a, a post on Instagram from the Trechikov Gallery from a few days ago. Uh, Trechikov Gallery is the main uh, art museum in, in Moscow that features solely Russian art. And the uh, post underneath the image says, in these days, we, like everyone, are following current events carefully and with concern. 
events to which we cannot remain indifferent. We believe that culture is intended to unite people, to provide hope, to create space for dialogue, enabling mutual understanding. And you can see some visitors to the museum, a uh, curator standing in front of this painting, which we see over here. And this is a very famous painting from the late 19th century by Vidishagan called Apotheosis of War, which he dedicated to conquerors past, present, and to come. Uh, and he painted it in protest of the Russian Empire's uh, expansion into Central Asia, into Turkestan. So this is sort of an asophic way of saying, uh, protesting against what's happening that is you know, a way to get around uh, sort of these, these uh, strictures, but still, still taking a risk. Um, uh, and I think uh, the use of black and white in the Instagram post is also quite uh, purposeful to sort of remind the viewers of that Soviet connection and that, that link back to we're returning to a, a time uh, where we really are not permitted to express ourselves, but we must, we must try. So as you, as you go forward and think about um, Russians involved, I think, Laura, you're gonna talk about this as well in terms of the effect on impacts on Russia with sanctions, um, that we, we are seeing uh, uh, that you know, it's, it's uh, very limited in terms of the uh, accessible information uh, that is the access to information. Um, and yet still, um, many Russians are are daring to speak out and, and trying to um, trying to protest. So that's what I would like to share. And next will be uh, Laura Taylor, Taylor, Associate Professor of Economics. Hi everyone. So I wanted, you know, I've been reflecting, I took this reflections title to heart this, you know, uh, this panel because I've been spending a lot of time this week reflecting about the economics of transition. You know, I, when I was sitting in seats like yours, um, when I was in college, I, I was an economics and Russian double major from 1990 to 1994, which is a pretty great time to be an economics uh, and Russian yeah. double major. <laughs> and every day it was, it was like a holy cow day. Like, oh my God, look, the currency collapsed. Oh my God, look, privatization is failing. Oh my God. You know, it was one calamity after another. And, um, you know, it, if you name, name the economic calamity and Russia was experiencing it, and there was likely a Western economic advisor behind it. Um, in my economics and Russian classes, we focused a lot on what we call the transformational recession. So think about like a Nike swoosh, right? That the expectation would be that, that Russia in sort of shaking off the vestiges of the planned economy would have to suffer a, a significant decline because you needed just a structural overhaul of the entire system. And that would be the down. But, but the idea being that you put market reforms into place as quickly as possible using what was referred to as shock therapy at the time, and then you would see that, that increase, right? You would see that growth. And we would all benefit from that growth. Of course, the Russian people would benefit from increased prosperity, but you know, economic growth and development and greater integration into global markets meant a reduction of conflict. I mean, that's, that's an argument that, and there's, lot, there's, there's good logic to that argument. I mean, it makes sense you know, at its core, right, that um, greater mutual dependence or greater economic independence would reduce conflict. And certainly if you pick the right group of countries at the, in the right time period, the data would, would provide evidence of that, right? Um, so we were willing to sort of suffer those, those pains of shock therapy. It was kind of an ends justify the means argument, at least in, in neoclassical theory. And then you know, in graduate school in the early 2000s, it, you know, most of the conversations in my political economy and comparative systems classes were about a critique of shock therapy, right? That we did it too fast. It was too, you know, it didn't take into consideration institutions um, and the institutional structure and, you know, more space should have been given to arguments for a more gradual approach. And, and so we had that, that debate and that discussion in classes, but we still you know, sort of agreed with this statement that greater prosperity and greater economic development and greater mutual sort of the greater integration of economic systems would would reduce conflict. You know, um, and I think that that even today, you know, in the courses I teach, I teach about the Russian transition and I teach about shock therapy versus gradualism. We talk about transformational recessions and we still talk about how greater <laughs> prosperity, greater economic integration, the integration of Russia into global markets will, will reduce conflict. And, and, you know, lots of smart people have been saying for a long time that that's just not the, the case, right? Um, in Putin's Russia. And, and it's, while 
we have seen GDP you know, growth relative to um, what things were like in, in, in 1990, and we have seen increases in per capita income. You know, we haven't necessarily, you know, this, the, that, that integration is not the panacea that we all, you know, sort of thought it to be, at least that I was taught it was and how I often sort of talked about it with my students. And so that's really been what I've been reflecting a lot about, about this week. Um, you know, th this president doesn't, he doesn't want to be president. All, all indications are that he doesn't want to be president of Russia. He wants the empire back, right? And um, so even with integration and of Russia into the global market, you know, it's, it, it, it's not going to assure, you know, it's not it's not going to necessarily reduce the conflict, right? That that we have to experience with this with this president. Um, but what integration has done um, is given us really powerful tools, right? That are non-military, right? That have still, you know, devastating consequences for the economy, and that's in the form of economic sanctions. And, and economic sanctions are not new tools. I mean, we've the those that have means have used financial penalties, you know, um, throughout history, but. But what we are seeing in, in this latest round of sanctions, you know, sort of starting in 2014, really um, with uh, the way that President Obama reacted um, uh, to the annexation of the Crimea was a different use of sanctions where we're not talking so much. We, we, of course, are, it's addressing trade, it's addressing imports and exports, but it's also really getting at the pocketbooks of the powerful, um, the elite in Russia, right? The so-called oligarchs. And with the idea being that that maybe hurts Putin, you know, um, um, in, in a way that that just, you know, simply sort of um, limiting um, uh, the flow of goods, um, which is a powerful tool is not, you know, sort of isn't sufficient, right? So, so now they're going after um, more personal targeted sanctions. And um, and then this, this round, you know, in, in 2014, it worked in the sense that we, we, you know, Russia lost a trillion dollars in GDP and GDP per capita was cut in half, but Putin still annexed Crimea and he's still president of Russia, you know, and so even that severe of a decrease seems, it, it was insufficient, right, to, to sort of stop his, his, um, his, his dreams, right, of, of, um, of getting into Ukraine. Um, so this time around, it's, all accounts are that it's going to much, uh, be a much more severe round. I mean, how many of you Wikipedia is swift this week, right? Who knew that the global <laughs> financial messaging system would be so sexy to talk about, right? So, I mean, all of us nerds are really happy right now. Um, so the current, the current situation for sanctions being successful it lacks two key conditions that we really need, one of which is, is that it's not a democracy, right? And that, and that sort of works against it, right? And the second um, is that the, the goals are not modest, right? That the goals are, are significant. And so, you know, but working for sanctions, right, is third that that there's a high immediate cost of the sanctions, um, particularly if the economic costs accrue to powerful groups, that tends to make them more effective, right? And the fourth is that, so you can check that box, right? And the fourth is that the sanctions are, are highly coordinated, um, that even though there are some carve-outs for energy, um, that will likely persist because of the impact that would have on, on um, the world energy markets if they weren't to have that carve out, the level of coordination among the allies and international organizations has been significant. And, and I've been um, pretty impressed with, with the fact that they did get it together, right, in a way, um, because it reduces the number of loopholes, right, in the workaround. So you, you saw this today, for those of you who might have noticed, that Belarus was added, right, because there was a, a concern that Putin would just act with, you know, sort of through Belarus, right, to get access to markets. And so, and, and those kinds of things will keep popping up, right? It's a little bit of whack-a-mole, you know, sort of as these, these loopholes are sort of discovered and, and manipulated, you know, then they'll have to be dealt with. Um, I think that um, I was really shocked at the move by the multinational firms, Shell and MBP, and, and you know, our two, our two examples. Um, for those of you who have read, they, they've pulled out, you know, so BP has given up its, its almost 20% stake in Rosneft and um, Shell is abandoning some joint ventures with Gazprom. And, and you know, using multi, you know, foreign policy has been conducted in the boardrooms of multinational corporations, in particular oil corporations for a long time. You know, oil diplomacy, you know, diplomacy was delegated to oil companies in the, in the Middle East, right, starting in the 1930s. But this is, they're taking a big financial hit for this. And so, you know, it's, it's I think it's something worth acknowledging and, and they, they did a political calculus, right? And they did an economic calculus. And they said that the, I'm sure that in those boardrooms, they said, you know, the, 
the tenuous nature of property rights in Putin's Russia, right, versus the gain in political capital they would get from making these moves. You know, so I, I, I'm a little cynical, but at the same time, the financial hit is significant, and I think that that's worth acknowledging. And now Apple is is pulling its its products out of Russia. Several car companies may have said so, and and I think this will this will keep happening. And so I think it's been so interesting to me that this coordination isn't just between political allies, but also between um, the political leadership and the multinational corporations, right? That, um, um, and so that, that makes this round of sanctions, I think, noteworthy and different. And, you know, we, who, we don't know, your crystal ball is as good as mine in terms of how, whether, you know, whether this will work and, and um, whether it, it will stop Putin where he is now or, or um, limit, you know, the, um, what he does. But, um, um, it's it's a different set of circumstances than we've seen before. So I think it's it's interesting and worth watching. Um, and then I would add um, that um, the it, it's important, I think, for all of us to keep in mind, and I think that we are here tonight, that these sanctions are targeted at Russia, at the Russian political leadership and the Russian economic elites, but they will have a significant and very real impact on the Russian people. I mean, we've seen this already, you know, on Monday, the depreciation of the ruble, um, we are going to see, you know, uh, inflation across, you know, all industries. It won't just be targeted, you know, at, at, at certain industries. You know, inflation is a is a is a cruel tax, and food inflation is sort of the, has been called the cruelest, right, of, of the taxes. And so we will see this. So in addition to the capital destruction and the devastation in the Ukraine, we'll, we'll have sort of similar um, um, economic devastation in Russia. And so I think that's worth, you know, it's worth thinking about, um, but it's probably unavoidable, right, because any sanctions that we use will will necessarily limit the flow of funds and goods into Russia, which means that will impact the day to day lives of 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 Russians. So um, maybe we found the right recipe this time. Um, the it, it, the particular targeting of the Russian central bank is interesting. Um, it's been called unprecedented. You know, it's hard to use that word, but. Um, there's some. There's still some loopholes that exist. For example, um, they talk, there was talk in the papers today about a need to limit Russia's access to special drawing rights at the IMF. I mean, so again, it's that it's that whack-a-mole. Um, but I don't know. I guess we will. We'll just have to see. I'll leave it there because I know some of you probably have questions. But um, I appreciate your time and thank you for letting me talk about my my love of transition economies. Right? So thank you. We will indeed first take questions. So if there are questions in the room, we have someone or two people with microphones on each side of the room. Um, and then there may be some questions coming in the QA. Yeah, so we're going to start with Paul McKean at the front. He can go on Zoom and we have a couple of questions there. But Abby's on that side. I'll certainly raise your hand and we'll try to work through some of these people. Uh, so this is a question for Professor Marx from an alum who said that they took your politics and pop culture class 20 years ago. Uh, um, the question is, uh, there have been many Russian athletes and, and high profile individuals speaking out against Putin's actions. Uh, what impact, if any, is this likely to have both on everyday people or also those in charge? Wow. <laughs> um, I would say that the, the impact is not going to be obvious immediately, which is to say that um, Putin obviously is in charge of Russia and he's pretty well insulated. And I think he's made it pretty clear that um, he doesn't care much about what the people of Russia, let alone people elsewhere in the world, really think about this. Um, I think that it's going to take time. Um, it could be a long time, you know, so I don't know who that former student was, but I remember in that class, we read a chapter in a book that talked about rock and roll and the Soviet Union. And that uh, for many years, the Soviet government tried to limit access to Western popular culture. Uh, they tried, they did try to co-opt some of it 
um, when they when the government realized that it couldn't keep all of it out. And so I do remember that there was some effort to sort of Russianize jazz, as it were. Um, but they couldn't keep the popular culture out. And when young Soviets started to listen to rock and roll, uh, when they had access to rock Western rock and roll music, they, well, obviously that didn't topple the Soviet government. Um, it did, it, there was a growing unease, unhappiness in, in the Soviet Union, um, which was predicted by one of the founders of the Cold War policy of containment, George Kennan. George Kennan, the famous, famous foreign office, for, uh, political officer, foreign service officer in the United States. He wrote his famous long telegram and his Mr. X article in Foreign Affairs, in which he argued that the way to stop Soviet expansionism is to contain it within its own borders. Some people construed that to mean military containment. Kennan, who lived past the, his 100th birthday, um, so that what he really meant was to encircle the Soviet Union with vibrant, prospering, liberal democracies. Um, because then the bankruptcy of the Soviet system would be laid bare to the Soviet people. So, but it took time. I mean, obviously, it took a very long time. And if Kennan was right, then I think these expressions of popular culture and popular unrest do have the ability over a long period of time to undermine the Russian government, but it's certainly not going to be something that happens like, you know, obviously overnight. Uh, this is kind of for the floor. Oh, this is awful. <laughs> this is kind of for the floor, but um, I know that when I was watching and I saw uh, their currency fall to be like less than a cent, um, my first thought was I had that image of like the kid buying bread, but it's like a wheelbarrow. It's a bunch of like the German currency after World War One, when they kind of got slammed uh, in the Treaty of Versailles. So I guess my question would be: Is there a fear that um, economic prolonged economic devastation could rally people into wanting a war in the future? And also, what is the responsibility we have after we just did this to them? <laughs> Probably after the Ukraine situation is figured out, <laughs> in war or not. Um, what is the responsibility that the world has for kind of trying to bolster their economy enough to not like destroy the world? Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> the you know the image of the of the wheelbarrow right is is an image of hyperinflation right. So so what what we just to lay the groundwork. Um, as the currency depreciates, in order to be able to keep it from falling and cause massive inflation, you have to you have to demand it, right? You have to buy it up. And you know, there's this argument that Russia has 630 plus billion in its in its foreign reserves, and this is what it could use, right? And this is the argument he's going to use this to, to prop up the currency. Except that you know, over half of that, roughly, I you know, I don't know, how, I'm not looking at the books, right? But a fair size of it is held outside. Russia and, and possession is nine tenths of the law, so now Putin can't can't get to it. And um, so the option would be to um, um, he's not going to have the ability to to prop up the, the currency, and therefore hyperinflation is going to result. And and it won't be limited to specific industries, right? It will be it will be across the board. I don't. Your question, I, I kind of want to focus on a little bit, I think, on your on your the second part of your question, which is after this is over, right? What 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 responsibility do we have? I mean, so so hyperinflation typically when, when it happens, what it means is that you generally have to replace the currency, right? So we saw this and we have to you have to revalue it, right? We saw this in, in Russia, in fact, in the 1990s when um they suffered um, thousands of percent right of inflation. And and it, it's you chop off a couple of zeros right at the end of your at the end of your and you have to reprint all your bills and things like that. But that's that's essentially what you have to do. You have to revalue your currency. And I remember I was in in um, Russia in doing my dissertation research in 2004, 2003, 2004, and my transit my translator at the time talked about it as when the time when the Russia the Russian government put away the zeros. I just sort of trying to, to sort of explain it to herself on, on when that happens. So that that will be most likely what will happen when that happens, you know, there will be, I would imagine, significant international intervention in the form of IMF and, and World Bank support, for example, and, and support um, through, if, if Russia wants to play at this, right, we could, you know, there could be regional trade agreements, and there could be all kinds of ways in which 
the international community might be able to help heal the Russian economy, but that would require a collaborator, right, in, in Russia. And so I think the, really the bigger question that I don't know the answer to is who, whether someone comes after Putin or whether Putin is still there when all this is, is said and done. Um, yeah. I'd like to also say something um, about what I think you also asked, which was um, how these uh, measures will impact the regime and what will the popular response be? Will people rally around the regime or not? And that's a great question. Uh, I don't think anybody has a clear answer. I have heard some commentators from inside Russia say that um, prior to the uh, invasion, um, um, Putin was sort of on the skids a bit. Um, there was a pension reform that's highly unpopular. Um, the country has been polarized for some time uh, politically. There's great inequality. There are a lot of cracks in the system. And one thing about authoritarian regimes is they, they have to maintain a certain dynamism, right? The, the leaders of these regimes exist by appearing to be dynamic and successful. Right? And so if you bring about a war that ends quickly and you have victory and things go great, then, then you're a hero. But if you bring the system crashing down, if everybody loses their savings, if, um, if the whole economy goes belly up and you get bogged down in a war in a neighboring country against which many people have, have uh, no hostility, then uh, that regime could totter. It's hard to know. On the other hand, I have heard some people say uh, that, well, suffering in Russia mobilizes people around the state. Uh, and so, uh, you know, historians shouldn't predict. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, we have examples of each thing happening. Yeah, so we'll see. Anyone on that side of the room? Yes, yeah, so I have a question about the Thank you. Uh, I am a Ukrainian immigrant and I have some family and friends in the country and I have been following the conflict. Um, I do have a question, I guess it's for the floor, but I've read quite a few articles studying um, Putin's actions and quite a few political analysts were uh, not expecting him to, to do what he's doing right now. Quite a few of them were saying that this is not a winning card that he's playing right now. And I would say that I agree with them, considering that the Russian economy is in the toilet. Um, but I was wondering if there's any theories on why he would do this. I mean, there's a theory of like he's he's trying to have that rally around the flat moment, as you said. Um, but I, I would just I think that he should have expected such strong economic sanctions and such a strong Western response. I, I'm not sure why he would do this. I. I think my comments at that one, it's good to see you again, um, is that um, I think there's there's general, there's a lot of discussion about how he may have felt he had sanctioned proof his economy, right, with the, the billions and, and hundreds of billions in foreign currency reserves he had accumulated. And, you know, for the last several years, he has been um, engaging with a, an import substitution policy, trying to make um, Russia more um, self uh, more autonomous, right? You know, sort of um, the ability to, to produce its own goods and services, and that's that's worked for a lot of food and some low scale industrial parts, you know. But but without a doubt, um, it still needs global markets, and um, so it, you know I can't get inside his head. It could be he misread his ability to withstand sanctions. That, that could be one example, or simply the lure of resources in the Ukraine. Right? I mean, when you when you are stretched for resources in your own country. I mean, how do we? This is this is this is the empire, right? That he wants back. I mean, that you know, when people conquer other countries, it's it's for resources, right? In, in various um, forms, and so it, it may be that he he felt that the risk was worth you know was worth it, right? That that yes, the penalties would would be severe, but the spoils of war would would more than make up for that. But again, we're not in his head, right? But I think I mean, that's the kind of calculus right, that that I would imagine that at least that, that people, you know, lots of smart people and on lots of Twitter feeds 
Right. I'm reading the same Twitter Twitter feeds and blogs that, that you are probably are, are, um, are talking about. But in fact, if we are able to adequately curtail the ability of the central bank to engage in foreign currency um, trade and exchange, the sanction proofing may prove to be to have been a, um, a, a misstep for him. Well, I mean, Laura's right. We can't get inside his head, but there have been suggestions uh, put forth by people who are, are fairly knowledgeable and know Vladimir Putin that um, the way he insulated himself during the pandemic has really compromised his ability to think these things rationally. And you know, I'm not a psychologist, but um, scholars of international relations do borrow from theories of psychology. And they do point out that leaders, just like anyone else, can be subject to misperception and bounded rationality. Um, all humans suffer from a propensity to cognitive bias and motivational bias, particularly if you are excluding information that is troubling or upsetting to you or doesn't fit in with how you see the world. Um, you know, I made the comparison at the outset between the outbreak of World War I and the invasion of Ukraine. And it's well known that Kaiser Wilhelm II, who was the, the, the monarch of Germany when World War I started, he made the decision to launch a two-front war, and then he isolated himself at his summer palace, where he didn't have people bringing information to him that would allow him to rationally calculate you know, what the outcome of the decision was going to be. If you don't allow yourself to hear information, you can't make a rational decision. And by all accounts, and knowledgeable people in government who know Putin and have met with Putin, people like Emmanuel Macron, the, the president of France, have said, um, this is not the Putin that we knew, that he has um, really isolated himself. He doesn't listen to people. He's in his own head and he's hearing what he wants to hear. And he may have really made a very great miscalculation. That this was not something he did. Uh, he didn't take a, a, a risk um, using all of the information that would have allowed him to, to, to calculate the likelihood he would succeed in this action. So we have uh, gotten several uh, questions on the same theme, and I think in reaction to Professor Bishop's uh, presentation, um, here's one version of it. Given all the restrictions on speech in Russia, um, how, if at all, can we get an accurate idea of what Russian citizens' reactions to the aggression against Ukraine actually are? And secondly, um, to, to what extent do you believe that the Putin government's propaganda efforts to explain the incursion are convincing the portions of the Russian population? Um, you know, I, I, I'll try to speak to this, but I have to say, I'm a literary scholar. <laughs> um, uh, that's where my heart and my, my, my brain is, but I care very much and I am following, you know, I'm, I'm you know, spending all night on Twitter. So I can talk about it from that sort of uh, level of, of experience. Um, uh, it, fortunately for for us in the United States, we still have access to independent Russian journalists. You know, we can see, we can read their, we can read their um, their feeds, um, and they are often, you know, writing in English. You don't have to be a Russian speaker to follow them. So there are a lot of good people that we can follow um, who who let us know more of what's going on. Also, a number of Western journalists who are living there and reporting from there, um, uh, who who are are you know following us and and some wonderful journalists in, in, in Ukraine right now who are covering the war and really focusing on, on civilian uh, casualties and, and how people are, are living day to day uh, through this experience. So we have access to that. Um, within Russia, uh, for you know the the people of the middle class, which is small, but it is there. Um, it is it is growing or was growing until until this point. Um, they they also know how to access this information. You know, you can get through some of these blockages with a VPN, and um, uh, but uh, so there is some some way to get in. But I think the amount uh, and the repetition of these lies and the the, the just flagrant lies constantly over and over and over again. Um, uh, no matter how reasonable a person you are, if you keep hearing that over and over and over again, 
everywhere you look, you know, it's, it's going to be hard not to start to believe it. So I think, uh, you know, this is going to be, uh, it's a huge challenge to try and reach, reach a number, you know, a large portion of the, of the Russian population. Um, but I'm, I'm hopeful. I mean, I have to be hopeful, but, uh, um, uh, you know, that, that uh, I, as educating ourselves, um, supporting these kinds of journalists who are working, you can support these kinds of organizations to continue doing their work despite all of these pressures. Um, uh, that we can, that we can, you know, have uh, a fuller uh, and, and also, frankly, show support uh, for those for those citizens who are who are actively not even as, I mean actively is, is taking a big risk. So who are who are um, opposed to what's going on? Give them. Uh, a sense that that we are we are we understand that this is not their choice. This is not their war. Hi, um, I have a question for the panel, but I also would like to speak to that last comment about how Putin's propaganda plays uh, out with the Russian population. And something that nobody has touched on yet is that Putin is painting this invasion as a denazification of the Ukraine, which is very critical because obviously the Russians as a people played a heavy, heavy role in defeating the Nazi regime in World War II. And so essentially when the war in Eastern Ukraine kicked off, some of the first responders were far right fascist militia groups, which were fighting the Russian separatists in the Luhansk and Donbass regions. And NATO and the Westerners, as well as the Ukrainian state, supported these groups, and they were even in coalition with some of the members of the government, right? And the truth is, there's is a very small portion of the Ukrainian people. It is ludicrous to paint Ukrainians as Nazis, as fascists, but that is still an appeal that Putin is making in his propaganda supporting this war. And you hear it even from the Russian soldiers that have been captured by the Ukrainian military. They say, we thought we were here to liberate Ukrainians from Nazis. And so that is a big part of his propaganda effort. And then for my question, um, we're about a week into this invasion. And I think that Ukraine has shocked Russia as well as the West with their heroic defense effort. We're six, seven days in and only Kherson is the main city that has fallen. They're still defending Kiev. They're still defending Kharkiv. They're still defending Mariupol, right? And I think that that is one area where Putin miscalculated, right? I don't think that he foresaw, as Professor Smaldone pointed out, he expected a quick, easy victory. And um, I think part of that is his insulation from his own military and his officers. He didn't really understand what Russia's own capabilities were. And I think that that will have severe political consequences for his regime down the road. My question is, um, will this change Xi Jinping and the PRC's calculus with their expansion in the South China Sea and their desires to retake Taiwan, right? This Putin has become an increasingly close ally and now his play for territorial expansion is bogged down and will face severe consequences. So I'd like to know if anybody on the panel can speak to you how the PRC might interpret these events. Yeah, I'll come to that comment first. I don't know a lot about um, East Asian affairs, but I would say that um, Xi Jinping is thinking a lot about Taiwan and the, um, the Chinese and the Russians are well aware that the United States these days in terms of its foreign policy, is in a rather weakened position. Um, uh, American imperialism was dealt a huge blow in Afghanistan. Um, we, the, the Middle Eastern wars did not go well. They are very aware that the American population has no stomach for war at the moment. And, and so I think there's, there's some thinking in, in Chinese leadership circles. Um, that, well, let's see what happens in Ukraine. Let's see how the West responds. Let's see what the Americans do. And it is interesting that at this particular moment, um, Biden has dispatched a series of, uh, a group of uh, American military people to Taiwan. 
to sort of tell them that we're with them and all of that. So um, there's a lot of posturing going on. Um, I think that the, the Chinese decision to play it cagey, right? To say, well, it's too bad there's a war, but we're not going to break relations with Russia. This is all a way of just sort of sitting back and waiting to see what happens. I think Bill pretty much has that right there. Um, anyone who claims to know the answer to that question, obviously, is just speculating. Um, <laughs> I was just speculating. <laughs> but, but, I mean, what, but, but you're cautious. Uh, there are people who are making definitive statements. There's some people who are saying that this was uh, that the Chinese government and Xi Jinping were were fully aware and were on board with this, and this is part of their grand strategy over time. There are other people who are saying that um, Xi Jinping didn't understand what Putin was intending. This is what I was saying about like making the analogy to when the ambassador to Iraq didn't understand that Saddam Hussein was capable of completely understanding what she was saying. And that um, as someone in the New York Times put it, uh, Putin suckered Xi, right? That Xi sort of didn't realize what he was saying. I think there's a third possibility which Bill has hit on which is that while Xi didn't entirely understand what Putin's intentions were, um, it's pragmatic now to sort of allow this to play out and to probe how the rest of the world is going to reply. In other words, if Xi didn't actually understand that Putin was going to take these steps, at this point, it's nonetheless very useful for Xi to gauge what the international community's response. In other words, if he could go back and redo this, right, he would sort of encourage Putin to do this as, as a way to probe. You know, this is a probe to see how the West and other governments are going to respond to this. So right now, while this may not have been what Xi intended, there are certainly certain advantages that he would that that could accrue to him by just as, as Bill says, wait, you know, sort of take notes um, and see how the world responds to this. Okay, uh, sorry. Um, I tend to talk about, so I'll try to keep it brief. Um, but I have uh, a couple questions. Um, one, one of them being, um, you mentioned earlier about an, every, uh, an approach to international politics that um, takes into account the everyday person, um, what would that look like? And how can we as everyday people push for that kind of uh, approach to politics um, as well? There's, there's no guarantee that, uh, you know, Ukraine's gonna come out one way or another. Obviously we're all hopeful, um, but when they come out the other end of this, um, what, what do we have? We have a certain responsibility to help them, given how much we've, you know, promised in the past to them, and how much we have not um, involved ourselves in this war. Um, how 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 will we approach our responsibility to help bringing up their government, especially given their history of, of conflict and instability, um, and regarding the possible empty power spot that may be there if President Zelensky um, does not make it out the other end of this. Obviously, we have a lot of um, responsibility in the war, as well as the EU and the UN and, and the UN and NATO as a whole. Um, but it's something that we need to think about after this, regardless of which way it goes, whether Putin's in power or not, how do we help Ukraine after this? Sir, do you want to take that part of the question? Are we going to help Ukraine? Yeah. Okay. That's really not my, <laughs> not my area of expertise. Well, when it comes to the everyday, I mean, your first question is what can everyday people do? You're doing it right now, right? So part of it is being an engaged, knowledgeable person. I would, I would say that part of it, this, and this might sound like an odd juxtaposition, is to re for everyone in the world to re-engage as the pandemic waves. I think part of, you know, there have been a lot of collateral damage to this pandemic. And one of the collateral damages of this pandemic is that people have been contained within their own countries. Countries threw up walls. When, when, when the World Health Organization declared a pandemic, um, virtually every country in the world closed its borders. 
And, you know, you, you could argue, well, and I've seen these arguments, you know, well, actually, that's not a bad thing because mass tourism contributes to carbon emissions. And maybe, you know, maybe there's a maybe there's an upside to um, discouraging people from getting on airplanes and emitting carbon all over the place. But um, I don't think it's, you know, like a cliche or if I'm Pollyanna to say, you know, I remember going on a study abroad program when I was a junior in college. We've got lots of students here who've not been able to go on study abroad programs. There's, there is, it, it sounds, again, so like a cliche and sort of like very saccharine to say, you know, like travel enriches people. It, 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 it's more than just enrichment. It's engaging with other people around the world. And I think that as the pandemic ends, people, even though, you know, getting in an airplane or in a car or a bus or train or cruise ship does emit carbon into the atmosphere, it also brings people closer together. And I think that it's important for people to reestablish cultural exchanges um, so that we understand people elsewhere around the world. Well, I don't definitely echo that. I don't know what we can do as, as sort of a nation, you know, in terms of infrastructure. How can we help Ukraine after that? But certainly cultural exchange is really important. And that's that's really hard to, to even fathom right now um, uh, in terms of cultural exchange with Russia and Ukraine for our students. Um, uh, we were hoping, uh, we had planned for two students to be studying in Russia this semester. Um, uh, and because already, uh, you know, months before the invasion, the State Department had put Russia at a, at a level four travel advisory um, for political reasons. Uh, students were not allowed to go. And so I was I was actually you know, planning to sort of argue against that because the reasons that they had at the time in December were, were really geared towards towards um, people, you know, at high levels of business, doing business, you know, it really didn't seem to have any impact on students. Obviously, that has changed dramatically. And when I think about um, the future, even for the next several years, when are we going to be able to um, have those cultural exchanges uh, between, you know, have, send America's, American students, send Willamette students to Russia or to Ukraine? It's just... You know, it, it, it's heartbreaking that, that that's, I think, where at this individual level so much can happen, uh, but that's, that's just not going to be possible um, in the foreseeable future, unfortunately. I think I would, I would just add one comment about aid and, you know, so the, the economics of it, which is we don't, it's hard to say how we, how we can, how we will be helping the Ukrainians rebuild when we don't yet know the extent of the destruction. I mean, if this ends tomorrow, you know, there, of course, there's been loss of life and there's been loss of buildings, but that's much different than if this goes on for, for six months and Kiev is, you know, destroyed. And it, we, we just don't know, but it, obviously there will be, there will be need for capital investment in the Ukraine, but it, that just won't be, be a U.S. issue, right? That's going to be an international issue. It's going to take um, international commitments, but we've, we've, we've rebuilt countries before, I mean, we're capable, we're certainly eminently capable of doing so with enough um, strength and of will and, and sort of determination. So, um, but really, to me, in my mind, knowing what that what that means and what that price tag is, and we have uh, it, it, it's entirely dependent on how long this lasts and how far he goes. Yes. So the question Q is one, two, <laughs> three, four, five, six. <laughs> Uh, one of our uh, nearly 200 uh, virtual attendees has a quick question. Um, so as we've seen uh, the rise of political fascism, both domestically and abroad, um, are Putin's actions, or to what extent are Putin's actions, the, the kind of inevitable conclusion of a broader shift towards totalitarianism more globally? I've been waiting for that question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, there, there are so many issues here at work um, related also to the prior question. I, I mean, these are all things that are related, it seems to me. One, the rise of authoritarianism um, in the world is, um, for, most, for most American governments historically, that has not really been a problem. Okay, that has not been a problem, as long as they do what we want them to do, right? 
And so when we think about our role in this whole morass, right? When we think about what we can do for Ukraine, right, one thing we can do for Ukraine is think about our role in creating the context in which this has all unfolded, right? So this is why we need historians, right? <laughs> so if you go back to 1993, right? Uh, there was a huge discussion in Russia in that period of transition about the nature of the of the presidency and the parliament. And the American government supported um, a new constitution in Russia at the time that emasculated the parliament and put all the power in the executive. And we did that because at the time, the executive was Boris Yeltsin, who was weak, and he did what we told him to do, and that worked great. And then he died, right? And we got Putin, okay, who is a completely different animal. So I don't know. Well, yeah, but but uh, barely. You're right. Okay, so <laughs> he, he left the scene. Let's just say, okay. And we got in his place. In his place, we got an animal of a completely different type, who has long seen it as his task to restore the empire. Who said often and early that the worst thing that ever happened in the 20th century was the dissolution of the Soviet Union, right? And so here he is, right? Trying to restore what he can of, of the old empire. The, the other element here, um, it, it seems to me is, uh, you know, we have supported um, nasty governments everywhere um, as long as they are sort of in line with our general geopolitical interests. The, um, the Russian government has long harbored right, all kinds of nasty types. I mean, Putin talks about fascism in Ukraine, but there are a lot of fascists in Russia, okay, who are used as sort of political strongmen for the regime. And so that that's something we have to remember, right? And um, there, there are also similar elements, as, as Heavy pointed out, in, in Ukraine. Um, but all of these, all of these, um, the countries in the region right, uh, have had their problems exacerbated by policies that have been imposed right, and um, presented to them as the only way forward. Right? And so when we talk about the, the shock therapy, right, the neoliberal order that was brought into Eastern Europe, that also came with the expansion of NATO. NATO, if the Cold War ended in 1991, NATO should have been dissolved. Right? NATO should have been dissolved. It was not dissolved, right? It was expanded, and that was it was expanded in what Bill Clinton and his foreign policy people called a policy of enlargement. Okay, which meant, which he talked about democracy, but what he really meant was private property in the market and capitalism, right? Um, and if you could give it a good parliamentary veneer, that was great, but it wasn't necessary, right? And the, the result has been. The penetration of, of NATO deep into Eastern Europe, deep into what had been the Soviet Union's um, borderland area. And um, one wonders uh, what would have happened if NATO had not done that. Right? And the, the, the thing about, about Ukraine that is to me really one of the big questions is um, how does one go about helping Ukraine after this debacle, right? We don't know what's going to happen, but let's say we're in a position, right, to help. Help might simply be to do the kinds of things that we described before, like cultural exchange. I don't know if help means us rebuilding the country with them. I don't know if it means that, because that usually means it's gonna be on our, our terms. And if, if we rebuild, Ukraine and they come, let's say they come into the EU, right, as um, another associate member and then later a full member, which is what was happening, right? Uh, if that happens, then we, again, one more time, we other the Russians, okay? We isolate the Russians and the Russians remain this boogeyman, right? Against whom we can, we can push our, our NATO bases right up to the border, right? No problem. Right? Because we, after all, represent bourgeois democracy, right? And they over there represent various kinds of evildoers, depending on the moment in history. Well, if we do that, if we if that's how we rebuild Ukraine, I don't think that's the right way to go. So.
Sorry, I'm talking loud. <laughs> so, okay, I have um, sort of like eight too many questions. First would be, um, isn't there sort of like, isn't one of the logical reasons for why NATO has expanded so much though is that historically a lot of the nations that were former Soviet republics have had a bad habit of being brutally reincorporated when Russia gets out of its sleepy, like lethargic stage. And that is kind of like why Lithuania and Estonia are really psyched to have, you know, the other big empire on their board, or, you know, on their side. Um, but yeah, so, so that was not my main bit. Um, but look, my main question was, this is sort of, I guess, for the history and political people and also the economics, this is for everyone. Um, <laughs> but look, this looks like a lot of the stuff that we're seeing with like the bank runs and the fact that the stock market still hasn't opened and then like a lot of the like savings of the middle class might be potentially sort of wiped out and like the uh, high reported casualty rates in Ukraine and all that kind of stuff kind of has been reminding me and some of the people I've been talking to about of like the other periods of time in which the sort of growing Russian middle class has been severely sort of put upon by a uncaring state and that has led to like middle class revolutionaries like pushing pushing up at the, the upper class demanding change. And I was wondering if, is there any expectation that that might happen or any sort of something, any, is there any sort of ideas of whether or not we're going to see political instability from below in Russia based off of this? <laughs> I think that um, there is historical evidence of that happening. You're right, but this the the concentration of wealth now is is a lot different than in prior periods, and so I, you know the the middle class while growing, you know, not as as Dr. Bishop pointed out. Um, this, this is going to take, they're going to take a hit. You know, um, I don't think this is just me speaking personally and, and um, I'm sure lots of people would disagree, but, but I don't know that they have the, the, the economic power to be able to, to influence outcomes right now. Not or not now with, with how um, the class system right, is structured now in Russia um, in terms of um, who has benefited from, from the rise of markets and, and that high concentration of wealth. And anecdotally, what we're seeing now is a lot of people who are in that, you know, middle class, um, who have the capacity, you know, some economic capacity, are leaving as fast as they can. They're they're finding the first way out to to Europe or to some other place. All about capital preservation. Okay. Hello, uh, I'm Connor Krista. I'm a CS major here at Willamette Computer Science. And I was wondering, I'm really interested in the informational conflict in this war um, and how the battle of like narratives plays out. And so I've got a two part question on how do we know that there are not informational filters affecting what we read like there is in Russia? And how do you make sure that the information you get is reliable? The mic's not working? It's just getting a little quiet sometimes. That'll Got it. Oh, okay. <laughs> I don't know why you're passing this to me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, well, you know, I, I think that we can be fairly confident that um, despite big tech's efforts, to sort of crowd out what it calls misinformation. And the internet has allowed people with access to the internet, free and unfettered access to the internet, to have more information now than the average person, you know, 100 years ago would accumulate. You know, you have more information at your disposal today <laughs> in one hour than the average person, you know, 100 years or two or three, 500 years ago had over the course of their entire lifetime. Uh, I can remember actually my grandmother telling me that she read the New York Times and she learned that 
the amount of text in the New York Times is the equivalent to like a book. So if you read the New York Times every day, it's like you're reading a book. Well, today, you know, you've got the internet and you've got you've got access to every book that's ever written. Um, now, obviously, um, there are, you use the word filter. I mean, obviously, there, there are narratives. Obviously, people are selective about what information they acquire and accumulate. Um, but, but I would say that, you know, if you have access to the internet today, you have a better ability to, to have access to a whole bunch of information. And hopefully, um, if you're looking at a lot of information, you'll see information that is discordant and inconsistent with each other. And that should alert you that some of it may be true and some of it's not true, right? That, that the sheer volume of information and the fact that the human brain is capable of of recognizing inconsistencies where one thing doesn't agree with another, that that should be an obvious, that should be obvious evidence that um, you have to exercise some critical judgment, right? I guess that's the answer that I have to that question. I don't know if that was entirely adequate, but that's my answer. Yes. Okay, um, I'm wondering if the sanctions aren't enough, like we've said so much about what they're doing and what they've done, but if they don't end up being enough and this doesn't stop Putin, um, is there any indication of what the next steps will be? And if the American government or others are equipped to handle the Russian invasion into Ukraine, like long term? So I just a brief comment and then I'll let the, um, some of the other panelists talk, but the sanctions, there is still room, right? There's still capacity to add additional sanctions, right? So for example, the, the energy markets, right? We've, currently the energy markets are being carved out in the, in because we are trying to not impact um, really, I mean, the European market, which is um, Russia is a primary supplier of energy there. But, you know, we could, you could cut off, right? Russia's sales, right? Um, in global energy markets. And it just means that they would have to sell all of their energy to, you know, to China or other sort of willing participants. Right? But, but that would, that would, that's another big card to play, right? And so that's just one example. I mean, there, there are more, more multinational firms that could pull out that will, you know, that's another example. You could, um, you know, hit, expand the list of individuals who are being targeted. So we're not at the end of the sanctions game, but I think you've asked a really key question, which is when we get to the end of that sanctions game, what, what comes next if it hasn't, if it hasn't worked? And I don't have, I don't, I don't have an answer to that, but I don't think it's a, whatever answer you might come up with, it's, it's not going to be a good one, right? I'm not going to be happy. Well, I can tell you what we shouldn't do. Uh, we should not send soldiers into Ukraine. Because we're in a shooting war with the Russians. Um, there are too many nuclear missiles pointed at each other. And it's just, yep. you can't risk the whole world to save one state. You really can't. Right? However, there's a lot of other things one can do. And um, um, you know, the, the sanctions or the um, economic actions that can be taken are still substantial. But also, you can pile a lot of weaponry into Ukraine, right? And you can... Um, do other things to enhance Ukraine's ability to fight. And right now, the Russians are not proving themselves to be particularly skillful. Right? They, they have. I think they have surprised themselves at how badly it's gone. They're, they're. You, you know, you, they have a forty-mile convoy outside of um, Kiev that sounds like the Long Island Expressway on a Sunday afternoon on the way home from the beach. I mean, nobody has moved, apparently, for days. The, the Ukrainians have been able to hold them up uh, at great cost. And, and so if a, if a relatively underprepared, relatively weak Ukraine can hold up the Russians at the moment of their shock and awe, right, then I think a, a Ukraine that is better equipped, that finally starts to train up its people, uh, with the help of neighboring countries, then um, uh, that's one thing that can be done. But uh, under no circumstances should American forces um, fight. Would it be old fashioned of me if I refer to Karl von Clausewitz? <laughs> <laughs>
who wrote, who published in 1831 on war, he argued repetitively over and over and over again, um, <laughs> war is an extension of politics by other means. And he said that war, I don't remember the exact quote, but war must measure with its scale and um, something with its scope. In other words, you should use, you should, depending on what the objectives are for war, you should use the means that are consistent with those objectives. So whatever um, the United States and other countries are going to do, they need to first know what their objectives are and then apply the means that are consistent with their objectives. And Clausewitz also points out that you should not refrain from whatever using whatever means are necessary to obtain your objectives and not apply more means that are excessive and go beyond what is sufficient to obtain your objectives. All right. Oh. All right. So, um, sorry. Uh, someone wonders, uh, what do you believe is the impact of countries like India and China um, refusing to denounce Russia's actions or um, abstaining in, in UN votes, et cetera? I mean, I think I don't have a, a great answer to that, but I, I don't know if anyone noticed, anyone else see the meme that said, if you, you, you really effed up if, if Switzerland's taken a side. Right? <laughs> so, it's just really, you know, it's, I, I don't know how much longer they'll be able to, so they'll be able to withdraw from the conversation. I, I do, you know, kind of going back, certainly back to China a little bit, I've been thinking about that for the last... 10 minutes or so, and, and this could turn out to be a really expensive thing for China, because if Russia needs someone to buy their rubles, right, it, it may end up being um, China that they turn to, and if Russia needs someone to buy their oil, it may be China that they turn to, and, and you know, China's got the money for it, um, or, or some money to, to spend there, but this could end up turning out to be a really expensive endeavor, so it may turn out that they have to to take to take a stand. I mean, I don't, you know, I, I can't get into the head of the Chinese leadership any better than I can get into the head of the Russian leadership. But um, if, if this continues, right, and this goes on and on and on, you know, the likelihood of, of impartiality is dwindles. That's, that's my two, that's my non-technical answer to that. I, I should leave the politics to the politics. The political science. Yeah. Well, for India right now, there's nothing to be gained, actually, from uh, doing more than just sitting back and watching. In, in, the Indian government in many ways is in the same position as the Chinese government, which is that um, uh, India has had a fairly close relationship with Russia and with the Soviet Union prior to that, um, particularly when Pakistan was lining itself more with the West. And Russia um, was uh, abstaining from UN resolutions that were condemning Indian actions in Kashmir. So there's a relationship between New Delhi and Moscow. And right now, as far as the Indian government is concerned, it is, again, I said there's really nothing for it to gain by taking a strong position. Um, the worse this gets for Russia, I think the more likely that the government of India is going to um, try to extricate itself from its relationship with Moscow. But right now, um, it can take a wait and see position. So we are almost at time. We have two more questions. The gentleman in the front here, and then uh, sorry, I can't put Carl's down. Yeah, safer for everybody. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so something goes uh, back very to the very beginning with uh, Professor Smaldone and the uh, tale about how Putin says that Ukraine has no sense of itself echoing what he said in particular about Crimea before there, and I've heard him say that about the Baltic Republics. And it's kind of a, a two-part question. Uh, one, historically, you know, how how relevant is this to these? And also, in the sense of, uh, especially with EU, NATO, at what point does the world accept Russia's purview to certain places? Is, is there some, something where people can say, Oh, yeah, sure. You can have that one. We don't care about it. <laughs> wow. I, I don't know. Um, I don't know what that point is. Um, it can go a long time. I mean, for, for example, I think with you with uh, Crimea, right, that was, you know, the, um, the boldest um, border violation, border seizure of territory. 
uh, to take place um, in, in Europe since the Second World War. Although I think you, could, I think some of the Baltic, Baltic states actually, um, not the Baltic states, sorry, the Balkan states, mm. um, during the wars of the 1990s, you know, we saw some some terrible, um, you know, wars of conquest there, border shifting, and so on. So the Crimea, um, uh, you know, wasn't alone, uh, uh, you know, as an aggressive act. Um, but Europe and um, the rest of the world has not recognized that action, um, and I, I don't think they're going to. Um, even though of all the actions he's taken, that's the one that is arguably the the strongest cases he's got, and that's because the there is a very large Russian population there, um, and you know he can make some arguments about the administrative transfer of Crimea. Um, to Ukraine back in 1955, right from the Russian Republic, as I mentioned before. Mm-hmm. So, um, but I don't think I don't think that's ever going to be recognized. Okay. Okay. It was such a blatant violation of the post Second World War order, which everybody claims to be wishing to retain. I just can't imagine them now saying, "Well, oh, it's all right." <laughs> no, I don't think that's going to happen. Make a sacrifice, Estonia. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering how much we know about the people immediately surrounding Putin. Um, I mean, we hear a lot about, uh, we hear about Russia as an autocracy, but also about it as an an oligarchy. Um, And so I'm wondering like what we know about those people. Um, And it's, it's hard to imagine that those people are entirely without Influence and so, given um, like the commentary of Professor Marx, that from a distance it seems like Putin's actions are pretty um, illogical, like potentially irrational. Um, is the, is there a possibility that the oligarchs directly surrounding him also see those see those actions as irrational, and that he might? get pushed back from his inner circle. So I'm going to just make some brief comments on that. I think, first, I think we have to distinguish between two groups of elites, right? There are oligarchs and there are what are referred to as cronies. And so the oligarchs have, you know, sort of come from also resource grabs in the in the 1990s and the early 2000s, and they have their own independent wealth, and that wealth has largely been been dispersed into the into the West in in various ways. The cronies are the, the state those that, that sort of their existence they rely on on the state capitalism of Russia for their existence, and so they they need that symbiotic relationship between Putin and his government and and their business um, their ability to to succeed in in business, and so that you know that's the group that's really surrounding Putin right now. Um, the oligarchs themselves are, are of course really important, but, but they, they have, they have the ability to sort of, you know, they, their wealth is independent of Russia's own production. If that makes sense. Right. I mean, now of course it's, it's impacted because we are seizing it, right. Or we are freezing it in many ways in, um, in the West, but it's, it's the cronies really that surround him and um, they, there's a parasitic relationship there. So it, the, the likelihood of, of getting significant pushback from the cronies is, is I think, I think very small. I mean, I think it's, it is really the, the oligarchs who have their wealth at stake in the West that are most likely to present the greatest um, points of pressure in my mind. But, you know, there are an awful lot of those and, and he doesn't need all of them, right? He just, he just needs some of them. And so, um, so it, it, I think that, it will be easy for Putin to continue to insulate himself against the ramifications of his actions. I know we're just about out of time, but I wanted to, um, if I may, give an answer to the previous question about how, what does Russia get to control? Now, I started with making an analogy to World War I. I think it's more than an analogy. The world today is still trying to answer questions that were unresolved by World War I. Specifically, um, what is more important? territorial integrity of countries or people's self-determination. And if it's the former, who gets to decide where territorial borders lie? And if it's the latter, who gets to decide what is a people and who qualifies for self-determination? And we are now over 100 years since the end of World War I, and we're still trying to answer that question. 
So we are at time. I just want to, we can do final remarks from the panel, but Honey Wilson up at the corner has, I know, sorry, Honey. She has um, information on ways in which you can support direct aid in Ukraine and other organizations that you would like. We'd love to give you that information and we'll hand it off to the panel for final remarks before we close out the evening. Well, so I'm just going to repeat what I just said. Um, <laughs> it, 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 it goes back to my comments about the pandemic. Um, in the interest of full disclosure, I'm writing an article about uh, the metaphor of states as containers. And um, the last couple of years, we've sort of gotten the idea that countries can handle things on their own because they're contained within borders. Well, people um, like viruses cross borders. Um, and, and I think we have to ask ourselves, what is the point of borders? What do they contain? Who's inside them? Who's outside of them? I'll leave it at that. It's a hard act to follow. <laughs> I might just, I might just say thank you right? so, um, for your time and for your engagement and for your really, um, really great questions. And it just is a, is a reminder of why I really love being a professor at Wilmington University. Yeah. That was just so kind and polite. <laughs> yeah. I, I hope that um, going forward, uh, we'll give a rethink to um, the post-1945 order that um, started out with great promise and ultimately brought us to this impasse, right? I mean, the, the thing that has happened in Ukraine um, in these past weeks have very deep roots. Right? They, they didn't all begin in 2014. They didn't all begin with Putin, right? Um, they, they are the results of the failure to resolve certain issues like, like Michael pointed out, right? And, and the failure really to, um, to actually change after 1990, right? to, to rethink the way we behave. Um, when we thought the Cold War had ended, we really didn't change very much at all, okay? We kept doing the same old thing. So I still have hope in the human condition. <laughs> and I'm hoping we can learn from this debacle and rethink um, the order of Europe and the order of the world in a different way. Uh, and I'd just like to come back to this, you know, how do we, how do we, uh, understand each other on the individual level as ordinary people. Um, and if we can't do cultural exchange, if we can't, you know, uh, physically travel, how can we do that? And, and uh, we can we can learn by reading, we can le read literature, we can ex experience each other's culture. Um, we can learn from each other right here in this community. We have a number of Russian speakers in the, in the, in the community, both at Willamette and in the larger community in Salem and in Oregon, from all sorts of different places. And you're gonna find people, many people who have very close ties to both Russia and Ukraine um, and to Belarus. So I think it's just really important that we recognize that, that uh, these individual people um, have very personal experiences um, that are not tied up and uh, directly to, to these sort of uh, um, larger structures um, uh, and, and have a lot to offer us in terms of understanding where they come from. So, so thank you all very much. Um, we really appreciate your time and your engagement. <laughs>